Euzu billahi mineşşeytanirracim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin ve salatu vesselamu ala rasulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmaîn. Ve men tabi'ahu bi ihsan ila yevmiddin. Subhaneke la ilme lena illa ma allamtena inneke entel alimul hakim. Hali alimul hakim. Subhaneke la fehme lena illa ma fehemtena inneke entel cevvadul kerim. Rabbi şrah li sadri ve yesir li emri ve ahlul uqtetem min lisani yefqahu qavli. Ve ufavvidu emri ilallah. İnnallahi basirun bil ibad. Allahümme salli ala seyyidina Muhammed ve ala ala seyyidina Muhammed. Salaten tuncina biha min cemi'i lehvali vel afat. Ve taqdilana biha cemi'i hacat. Ve tutahhiruna biha min cemi'i seyyiat. Ve terfa'una biha indeke ala derecat. Ve tuballiguna biha aqsal gayat. Min cemi'i l-khayrati fil hayati ve ba'd al-mamat. Amin ya mucibet da'avat ve ya qadiya l-hacat. حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير غفرانك ربنا ولك المصير اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ولسانا ذاكرا مشاكرا وتوبة نصوحا ربي يسر ولا تعسر ربي تم بالخير ربي زدني علما وفهما وألهقنا بالصالحين اللهم اجعلنا من التوابين واجعلنا من المتطهرين واجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين واجعلنا من الذين لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحسنون يا رب العالمين يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا قدوس يا سلام لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Respected brothers, very respected sisters جزاكم الله خير جزاء for joining us, rejoining us on the internet for this evening as well as you patiently, patiently waiting for us this evening. As promised, inshallah, we will continue with our discussion on Isra wal Mi'raj that we began last week. Many of you requested a written copy of the, the collated hadith on Isra wal Mi'raj, the collated hadith of Isra wal Mi'raj. In other words, uh, the great Shaykh, Sayyid Muhammad ibn Alawi, ibn Abbas al Maliki al Hassani, rahmahullah, he has. He has collated all the hadith on the Isra wal Mi'raj and put it into one particular format. And the whole booklet, whole thing is about 25 pages or so. I put down together everything and in, a, in an understandable format. And inshallah ta'ala, this is available now on the internet. If you were to log on to uh, ymatv.com uh, page, you will see the PDF file. So if you were to download it, and you can see it, you can print it, you can either read it, or at the moment when you are watching, when you're watching over the internet, you can also follow it through, open up the PDF file, and inshallah you can see it. Uh, but before inshallah we continue from the place where we stopped last week, I want to take you through basically on the concept of Isra wal Mi'raj, little in a summary form, and give you, open up a little window for you, so you can relate to what Rasulullah went through in terms of distance, in terms of space, in terms of what we can understand, the uh, human beings who live in the 21st century. The word Isra, sometimes translated into English as rapture. Rapture, probably none of you have he ever heard. Rapture, if you were to look at the dictionary meaning, it means that when you are divinely taken away from your earthly existence into to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rapture. This whole, the whole thing is called, you know, so when you take it, you go through out of body experience or an experience of this supernatural nature, rapture. So if you were to look at, when I use the word rapture, I mean isra, ascension. When I use the word ascension, I mean, I mean mi'raj. But usually I use isra wal mi'raj because every Muslim knows about this and every Muslim should know about this. Isra refers to the journey of Rasulullah ﷺ from sacred mosque, Masjid al-Haram, in Mecca, to the distant mosque, Masjid al-Aqsa, in Al-Quds, on Buraq, in the company of Jibreel alayhi salam. Miraj refers to what happened to the Rasulullah ﷺ, to Rasulullah sallam when he ascended from Masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem up to beyond the seventh heaven, where five daily salat was prescribed, and they're returning back in the same fashion in the same night. That case supposed to be Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, by the way. Uh, my, this computer didn't recognize the font. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers in Surah Al-Isra, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Subhanallahi asra bi'abdihi laylan min al-Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa al-Lazhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina. Inna huwa sami'u al-Basir, sadaqallahu al-Azim. Glory be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who did take his servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a journey by night from the sacred mosque to the father's mosque. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whose precincts we did bless in order that we might show him Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is, some of our signs, surely he is the hearing and seeing. Now, we went through all of these in detail. So, what did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? From Mecca al mukarramah all the way to Jerusalem, right? In that, in that section you can see where the arrow is showing. That journey by camel ride, old style of traveling, one month journey. He did this, he did this so quickly. He will experience time within time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created time within time. So according to some of the ulama, as we said last week, when he came back from all his experience that he went through the samawat and ard, everything finished, when he came back, the water that the jug, the, the, the pitcher that he made wudu from, the water was still running. Time within time, an experience. Where did he go? Masjid al-Aqsa. Where is Masjid al-Aqsa? Over there. And there is Masjid, what do you call? Qubbat al-Sakhra. This, the yellow dome on that side, on that side, the majority of the Muslims in the world today think that that's Masjid al-Aqsa. That's not Masjid al-Aqsa. Masjid al-Aqsa is actually this particular, this, this side, the small one on the side, a little masjid. Not as elaborate, not as, you know, uh, looking glorious like the Masjid al-Sakhra, uh, what do you call? Uh, Qubbat al-Sakhra, the other one. But this is Masjid al-Aqsa. But as we said, this was built 64 years after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away. This in the original place, the original temple of Solomon was not the Masjid al-Aqsa of today. So there was a place of worship before. From where to where? This is from Haram al-Sharif. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, I was next to Hajr Ismail, that semicircular place. I was there. Jibreel alayhi salam came, as the story goes, with Mikhail and Israfil. They operated on me with Zamzam water. They opened up, but they washed my heart. They filled with hikmah and wisdom and ilm, everything else. Then closed it up. And the Burak came, and I took the journey with Jibreel alayhi salam. And we went where? From Masjid al Haram to all the way to Masjid al Aqsa. These two places. This is called, this particular journey is called Isra. We went through and explained these, the exact date and year of uh, sorrow, a day, what do you call a year and a half before Hijrah to Medina. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lost his uh, beloved wife as well as beloved uncle. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called this particular year, year of huzun, year of sadness, sorrow. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a gift of mi'raj. It gave him a treat, called him upon himself. So place of departure we mentioned, the operation we mentioned, washing with Zamzam, pouring of wisdom and knowledge, the uh, test of milk and wine we also spoke about, the whole journey we went. What he witnessed on the way, we were going through from the hadith, this particular hadith. What happened in Masjid Al-Aqsa, he led the salat, the, then of the Prophet of the other Anbiya, then we, the Miraj happened, the ascension into heavens began, and going through the Samawat, we have not gone through yet. Samawat, Samawat in Arabic means skies, the heavens. He usually translates into English as heavens with a small h. When you do a capital H, it means the paradise. There's nothing to do with that particular heavens, that heavens, right? This is just Samawat. The size of Samawat, according to one particular hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, ulama teach us, that the size of this universe of ours, with all its galaxies, billions of galaxies, the unlimited space that we think that's still expanding, only constitutes the first sama. The size of the first sama compared to the second sama, they say is like a ring, small ring, that is chucked onto Sahara Desert. Huge. The size of the second sama compared to 
The third sama is like another ring in the desert. The size of the third one compared to the fourth one, the size of the fourth one compared to the, the fifth one, and fifth one to the sixth one, sixth one to the seventh one is exactly the same measurements. Fascinating. But this you say, oh subhanallah, this doesn't make sense. How in the world I can relate to this? Very simple. So what I, what I did actually, uh, made a little comparison. Little comparison, we all go to the moon. How far is the moon from the earth? Not far, huh? You can see it just around the corner. Yeah, it takes a long time to get there and so difficult to get there. So what happens? Let's make a comparison, just size of things. So you can understand the concept of why, how far Rasulullah ﷺ traveled. The Qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here you are. These are, uh, these are our neighbors. We are earth. Compared to Mars, look, look at the size of it. Mercury, Pluto, and Venus. These are the, pla the planets within our solar system. Correct? Look at the sizes. You can see it. Now, we are biggest compared to these ones. How about these ones? Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. Earth is a small little fella here compared to those. And you can't even see Pluto. Pluto is just a little pixel with the uh, little arrow. Now, how about this compared to our sun? Where is our earth again? That's a little. And where are you? Imagine the size of things. That's the sun. Millions and millions of times bigger than earth itself. Now, you ready for this one? Sun is big, right? How about this one? These are the nearest stars to us. Look at the size of the sun. Where is the earth again? Earth is invisible at this scale. You can't even see it. That's the sun, our sun. Smallest over there in the corner, left corner. Okay, let's go. One more time. Remember the, the, the, the, this Acturus? This fellow here, the Antares, the, this one Acturus? What happens to him next? He's a little pixel somewhere in the middle. This is within our first galaxy. This is, this is in the, the, we are not even outside our galaxy yet. The Qudra, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they, call, they talk about the uh, black holes, bigger than stars and the suns, just swallows the galaxies. How it does? Allahu Akbar. Read about it. Open up your science books. All you have to say is, SubhanAllah, such a qudra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who created everything. Because nothing comes into existence out of nothing. Nothing can create itself. Impossible. Everything has to be created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wajibul wujud, the originator, original creator is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His qudra, his power, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show him. From the Arabian desert, he took Nabi Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and took him to the journey. He saw so many things, weird and wonderful. Surah Al-Najm, we looked at last week. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have showed him this, this, this, and his eyes never belied him. He was, he was seen such an experience. It is not an abduction, alien abduction. It is not some UFO sighting of any kind. This is Jibreel Amin, alayhi salatu wasalam. Taking him with Buraq all the way to, from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. From Masjid al-Aqsa, after the happenings, took him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And came back, and came back to the place. Exactly where he was before. Then the question is be questioning began. So I can go back. You, you can have a look again. Just the Earth, and of course, 
Next one. The next one. And the next one. And the next one. The sun cannot be even seen, even a dot, a pixel, compared to the side of these. So when Rasulullah talks about the size of Samawat, we need to take it, think it in, along these terms. So maybe then it makes sense to us. Inshallah, you can have a look at those. I'll go back to the actual hadith itself. We stopped last week just at the edge of uh, Sama. The only thing that was a bit confusing to some people, some of the incidences that happened after Rasulullah reached the higher he heavens when he saw Jannah and Jahannam, some of them were shown to him beforehand according to this order here whatever you take it's true whatever you believe in it is true these things have happened and all the references are given here whether these hadith are sahih or hasan all references are given by the ulama of the muhaddithun now Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I'm just continuing from the place we went. And inshallah ta'ala, please help me or stop me if you don't understand anything. Because it's very simple to understand. Rasulullah went on for a little while and he saw people, groups of people, whose lips were resembled the lips of camels. Brrr, big. Their mouths were being pried open and they would be stoned. One version says of the hadith, a rock from Jahannam was placed in their mouths and then it would come out again from their posteriors, backside. Rasulullah said, I heard them clamoring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He asked, Ya Jibreel, who are these people? Jibreel السلام, said, They are those of your ummah who eat up the property of orphans and commit injustice. They are eating nothing but a fire for their bellies and they shall be roasted in Jahannam. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went on for a while and he saw women suspended by their breasts and other hanging, uh, others hanging upside down. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I heard them clamoring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He asked, who are these, O Jibreel? Jibreel alayhi salam said, these are women who commit zina, fornication, and then kill their children. Then Rasulullah ﷺ went on for a little while. He saw groups of people whose sides were being cut off for meat and they were being devoured. They were being told, eat just as you use. They, they take the meat from their sides and chuck it stuffed into their mouth. Eat as you used to eat the flesh of your brother. You used to make riba. You used to do backbiting. Rasulullah ﷺ said, Ya Jibreel, who are these people? He replied, they are the slanderers of your ummah who would bring shame to others. Then Rasulullah continued for a little while and he found, a cons found the consumers of usury and the property of, uh, the, uh, of the property of orphans and others in various loathsome states as those who have been described in the, uh, the sections before. What happened in the second sama? Then they ascended to the second heaven. Jibreel alayhi salam asked for the gate to be opened. The gatekeeper said, who goes there? Who is it? He said, Jibreel, who is with you? Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Has he been sent for? Is permission given to him? We know you. You got the ID card. We can recognize you, but who's next to you? Nobody has passed through these gates before. Has he been given permission? Yes. He's being given permission. Welcome to him from his family. May Allah grant him long life, O brother of ours, and deputy of Allah, and that, that excellent brother 
and deputy. What an excellent visit is this. The gate was opened, then they came in, in the, and they saw, they came in and they saw sons of two, two sisters. Who are these prophets? Isa ibn Maryam and Yahya ibn Zakaria alayhim salam. Two prophets, Isa alayhi salam and Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist. Jesus and John the Baptist. They resembled each other in clothing and a hair. Each had within him a large company of their people. Their ummah was there with them. Isa was curly haired of medium built, leaning towards a fair complexion with hair let down as if he were coming out of the bath, wet almost. He resembled Urwa, Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi radiallahu an. Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi radiallahu ta'ala an. Who was this person? A companion of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Who is from, Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad, from Ta'if. He came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and accepted Islam in the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said to him, keep your Islam quiet. Don't tell anybody yet. He says, no ya Rasul, I want to tell people in Ta'if. I'm afraid that they're going to do torture to you. They'll kill you. And Rasul, he said, ya Rasulullah, they wouldn't even know. Even if I was sleeping or shouting amongst them, they'll ignore me because I'm such a person. They will never know me. That was not good enough. So he went to his, uh, his uh, Ta'if, his uh, town, and there he began to read Quran, began to call people to Islam, and of course they rejected. Not only did they reject him, one of them actually took an arrow and right into his heart or somewhere in the chest, and he's dying on the spot. On the spot. And when, he said, they, when they said to him, who's going to save you now? Where are you going now? Is, this your, is your religion worth your death? He said, of course, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam promised, Jannah, he says, I'm going, to get, I'm going to receive. You are the losers. He died. When the news came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about him, he is like the person who's mentioned in the second page of Surah Yasin. The third person who came from the downtown, downtown and said, Why don't you believe these people? These people are who? Messengers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This particular person, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, He shall be like him on the day of judgment. This particular sahabi. Urwa ibn Mas'ud al-Thaqafi radiallahu ta'ala an. Then, this continues in the second sama. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa greeted both of these prophets. And they returned his salam. Then they said, Welcome to the righteous brother and the righteous prophet. Then they invoked for goodness on his behalf. They made dua for him. Then they ascended to the third sama. Jibreel alayhi salam came and knocked on the door and the gate opened. Someone said, Who is this? Jibreel alayhi salam said, It's Jibreel. Who is with you? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Has he been sent for? The same ID checking. He said, Yes. Welcome to him from his family. May Allah grant him long life, O oh, brother of ours, and a deputy of Allah. And what excellent brother and deputy. What an excellent visit is this. The gate was open, then they came and saw Yusuf alayhi salam. And with him stood a large company of his people, followers. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa greeted him, and he returned his greetings and said, Welcome to the righteous brother and the righteous prophet. Then he invoked for goodness on his behalf. Yusuf السلام, had been granted the gift of beauty. His jamal, his beauty was how? According to one narration, it says, he was the most handsome creation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had ever created amongst the human beings. And he surpassed people in beauty the way the full moon surpassed all the stars. Rasulullah وسلم, asked, Who is this, O Jibreel? He replied, Your brother Yusuf. In the fourth sama, then they ascended the fourth heavens. Jibreel alayhi salam asked for the gate to be opened, and they went through the same procedure. Then, when the gate was opened, when they came in and they saw another Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Idris alayhi salam. Allah exalted him to, the, to a lofty place. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa greeted him and he returned his salam, and he also made dua and invoked blessings upon Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In the fifth sama, the fifth heavens, they went through the same process. I'm just skipping the hadith. 
uh, the, exactly the same things are repeated. Then when the doors are open, they went through and they saw who? Harun alayhi salam. Aaron, brother of Musa alayhi salam. And the description is given of him in the hadith. Half of his beard was white and the other half was black. It almost reached his na navel due to its length. He had a long beard. Surrounding him were a company of the children of Israel, listening to him as he was telling them a story. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam greeted him and returned his greeting, uh, gre greetings and said, Welcome to the righteous brother. And he also made dua to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The sixth tama, the same things happened, the sixth heaven, the doors are open, the same procedure. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed by the prophets who had with them less than 10 followers in all. Then he saw a huge dark mass, Sawad al Azim or Adam. What was covering the firmament? He said, What is this throng, Ya Jibreel? In other words, he saw a huge number of people. Jibreel alayhi salam said, This is Musa alayhi salam and his followers. Rasulullah sallallahu immediately panicked. He says, they're so huge in number. Now raise, and, raise your head and look. He raised his head and saw another huge dark mass that was covering the firmament from every direction he looked. He was told, this is Musa alayhi salam, but huge, a million times more than bigger than what you see here is your ummah of your followers, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and besides these, there are 70,000 of them that will enter paradise without giving any account, any hisab on the Day of Judgment. As they went in, Rasulullah saw so Musa ibn Imran salam, again a tall man with a brown complexion, similar to the one of the Shanu'a, the Yemenis, the pure lineage and manly virtue, with abundant hair, lots of hair. If he had two a shirt, if he had two shirts on him, still his hair would exceed them. Subhanallah. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi greeted him, and he returned his greeting and said, "Welcome to the righteous brother and righteous prophet." Then he invoked for goodness on his behalf and said, "The people claim that among the sons of Adam, I am more honored by Allah than this one. But it is he, you, ya Muhammad, who is more honored by Allah than me. Look at you." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called you to himself. To me, he just spoke to me. I wanted to see him, he would not even let me see him. But he says, you are the most honored. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached Musa alayhi salam, And Musa alayhi salam kept on crying. He was asked, what did, what did that makes you weep, ya Musa? He replied, I weep because a child that was sent after me will enter, will enter more people in paradise from the, his ummah then will enter from my community. The children of Israel claim that among the children of Adam, I am the one most honored by Allah. But here, one man among the children of Adam who has come after me in this world while I am in the next world and is more honored. If he were only by himself, I would not mind. But he has his, his ummah with him. Now the, this particular scholar, changes the argument to something very serious. This is the proof of the famous saying of the master, Abu Yazid al-Bistami, Qattasallahu sirrahu al-Aziz. He says, we have crossed an ocean on the shore of which the prophets stood befuddled. That is, we the last ummah of Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa have been granted in the person of the seal of prophets, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khatam al-Anbiya, levels of knowledge, election and divine favor, which previous prophets have longed to receive. One of the du'as of Isa alayhi salam, also one of the du'as of Musa alayhi salam, is to come back to this, this world, again to be an ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This does not however contradict the tenant, a creed of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah expressed by Imam Al Tahawi in his Aqidah, whereby a single Prophet is higher in rank than all the awliya put together, which is true according to Aqidah. 
This is not contradicting. Imam Abu Yazid al-Bistami is showing the status of this ummah com in comparison to the other ummahs. That's all he's saying. In the seventh sama, they went through the same procedure, knocking on the door, and they came and th they came and visited. They saw who Ibrahim alayhi salam, al Khalil, Khalilullah, sitting at the gate of paradise on a throne of gold, and back of which was leaning against the al Baytul Ma'mur. In English, inhabited house, Bayt al Ma'mur. What is Bayt al Ma'mur? It's coming in a minute. With him, Ibrahim alayhi salam, a company of his people, his ummah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam greeted him, and he returned his greeting and said, Welcome to the righteous welcome to the righteous son and the righteous prophet. Ma'mur means inhabited with the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the great number of angels. Inhabited house means full of what? Dhikr and the malaika. Bayt al Ma'mur. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about the masajid. He said the true masjid, a good masjid is the one where it is, i'mar is done onto him. I'mar, not as in mi'mar as in build it, but this is where it is inhabited by people who pray in it a lot, who make dhikr in it a lot, who teach the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a lot. Okay. Ibrahim alayhi salam said to him, Oh my son, Order your ummah to increase their seedlings of paradise. For its soil is so excellent and its land is so plentiful. Huh? Ibrahim is asking to tell his ummah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he says, increase their planting seeds in their hands. Increase it. Put seeds into Jannah. Because it is the most fertile land. How? What does that mean? Rasulullah sallam said, Ya Ibrahim, what are these seedlings of paradise? Where do you get these seedlings from? You buy it from the market? No. Ibrahim sallam said, Each time they put, they say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al-ali al -azim. There is no change, no might, no power, no strength, except with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Hi, the Almighty. Another version says, Convey my greetings, salams to your ummah and tell them that paradise has excellent soil and sweet water and its seedlings are Subhanallah, Walhamdulillah, Wa la ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billahi al -ali al Each time you say this, there is a seed put in Jannah, MashaAllah, grows. You, you plow your own land, you put your, you put your what do you call? Your amal al-salihah in there, so it is prepared for you when you get there. This reminds me, reminds me of uh, uh, Darwish Yunus. In his dream, just a dream, he woke up in Jahannam. He's one of the great walis of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yunus, Darwish Yunus. He saw Jahannam is absolutely empty, nothing, no fire. And he saw a couple of angels walking there, patrolling there, patrolling there, patrolling there. He said, he came to one of these and says, excuse me, is it Jahannam? They said, yes, Ya Yunus, of course it is Jahannam. Then they said, and then he said, but Jahannam is supposed to be hot, you know, fire, burning. Where is the fire? They smiled at him and said, Ya Yunus, don't you know? People bring their own fire with them into Jahannam. And with these stones, they are lit up and they burn. In other words, they bring their own sins. They bring their bad deeds with them. As a result, they get their punishment. And they light up everything. It's all auto system when you get into the Jahannam. Similarly, says, Jannah is free, empty. So beautiful, said the land. So you bring your stuff. In other words, dhikrullah, your amal salihah, salihah, khayran hasanat, your ibadah is what builds your jannah. This is what Ibrahim alayhi salam says. With Ibrahim alayhi salam was sitting a company of people with pristine faces, similar to the whiteness of a blank page. The next to them were people with something in their faces. The latter stood and entered a river in which they bathed. 
Then they came out having purified some of their hue, colors. When they entered another river and bathed and came out having purified some more. Then they entered a third river and bathed and purified themselves and their hue became like that of their companions, completely white. They came back and sat next to him. Rasulullah said, O Jibreel, who are those with these white faces and those who had something on their faces, some color? And what are these rivers in which they entered and had a bath? Jibreel said, Ya Rasulullah, the ones with their white faces are people who never tarnish their belief, their iman with injustice or ma'asiyah, disobedience. Those with something on their faces are people who worked, who would mix good deeds with bad deeds. Then they repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah relented towards them. As for the rivers, then the first is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's rahmah, rahmatullah. The second is his favor, ni'matullah. And the third river is, is their Lord, gave them a pure beverage to drink. وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابٌ طَهُورًا As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when they drink this, they are completely purified. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was told, this is your place and the place of your community. He saw that his ummah were divided into two halves. Two halves. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is seeing the future. Not currently, the future. As in, in the hereafter. One half were wearing clothes that seemed as white as a blank page. The other were wearing clothes that seemed the color of ashes or dust. Gray. He entered Al Bayt Al Ma'mur, the inhabited house. And those who were wearing a, the white clothes entered with him, behind him. Those that were ash colored clothes were no longer able to see him. And yet they were in the best of states. Rasulullah prayed in Al Bayt Al Ma'mur together with those of the believers and the Malaika with him. Every day, Rasulullah says, 70,000 angels enter Al Bayt Al Ma'mur who shall never return to it until the day of resurrection. Every day, 70,000 angels enter, like the Kaaba, they make tawaf around Bayt Al Ma'mur, enter and make salat, and leave and never come back again until Qiyamah. This Bayt Al Ma'mur, this house, is exactly superposed to the Kaaba. Uh, ulama tell us, if one stone fell from it, it would fall on top of the Kaaba. Kaaba is the house of Allah on earth, Bayt Al Ma'mur, where we make Hajj, and the Bayt Al Ma'mur is the where Malaika make the Hajj. Tawaf. The angels who have entered never see it again. One version states that presentation of three vessels, Rasulullah's choice of the vessels of milk, the Jibreel approved, approval took place at this point. Remember at, right at the beginning, there was a mixture that Rasulullah is offered milk and wine. And Rasulullah chose the milk. And Rasulullah was told, you have chosen the fitra. And we spoke about fitra before. So they said, you have to chosen. If you chosen wine, your ummah would have deviated from the path. As Shami adds, at Tabarani cites this hadith with a sound chain. The night I was enraptured, I passed by the heavenly host, and lo and behold, Jibreel was like the worn out saddle cloth on the camel's back from fear of his Lord. Subhanallah. One of Al-Bazzar's narration states, like saddle blanket, that clings to the ground. Jibreel alayhi salam was so scared at that point. Shaykh Muhammad ibn Alawi said, of the same meaning is the hadith, kun hilsam min ahlasi baytik. I don't know whether the, the, the, the, the, the makharij is correct or not. Be one of the saddle blankets of your house. That is, keep to it in times of dissension. Now we talk about the low tree, the farthest limit of creation. Then Rasulullah was raised up to the low tree after the seventh sama. The farthest limit. There ends whatever ascends from the earth before it is seized, and whatever descends from above before it is seized. 
One of the greatest ulama at Dardir says, this is the eighth ascension, meaning that is the ascension to what is higher than Siddhatul Muntaha, by means of eighth step. So that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa reached the top height of its branches in the eighth firmament, which is called Al-Kursi, the chair or the footstool, which is made of a white pearl. So after that, Kursi. This is found in Al-Qaylubi's work and it is the apparent sense of the account. However, it is contradicted by what is mentioned later. Then he came to the Kawthar, because the Kawthar, like the reminder of the rivers, flows from the base of the tree, not from the to top. Therefore, this particular narration is not uh, taken seriously. Sidratul Muntaha. Last week I mentioned, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Twice I saw Jibreel Amin alayhi salam in his true form. Twice in my life. One is at the Hira, the mountain. When he delivered the message, Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq, he was squeezing me. When I came out, when I looked up, he says he was sitting on a throne according to one version. Or I saw he's stretching his wings so big, so big that everything is covered. The, uh, what is that uh, Hollywood uh, junk movie? Independence Day? Is it? When the aliens come, when you look up the sky, you see nothing but the spaceship. Something similar experience. I'm just uh, trying to relate to the young people. So when Rasulullah ﷺ looked at the heavens, he saw nothing but huge creature. This beautiful, amazing, glorious creature. Rasulullah says, I've, I've seen Rasulullah, the Jibreel Amin there once. And when, according to uh, Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi, rahimahullah, he says, when Ahmad Mukhtar alayhi salatu wasalam, when he saw Jibreel in his full glamour that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him, Ahmad Mukhtar alayhi salam just fainted for an hour. One hour. And he came to his senses. He was so scared. Zammiluni, zammiluni. That remember, he goes home, he's so scared, so afraid. But he says, if Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi salam were to stretch his greatness, his wings of nubuwa, his, his value, his worth, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, showed it to Jibreel alayhi salam. He says, Jibreel alayhi salam would have fainted there and then, and never to wake up until the morning of Qiyamah. This is Nabi Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi salam. He says, I have seen him twice. One here on earth, and the second time at Sidra, Sidratul Muntaha. With his glory. Beautiful, amazing, thousands of wings. Fascinating. We don't know how the angel looks like. So it is not a woman in nightgowns with little wings. It is definitely not. Or whatever the Hollywood movies teach you what an angel look, looks like, definitely not. Okay? We do not know. Nurani, the cre creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The eighth ascension took place at the later point and the present stage is only an exposition of, the, of his coming to the base of the tree, which is the seventh heaven. Another narration states that it is the sixth heaven. That Lot is in the, say, the sixth heaven. Allahu Alam. What harmonizes the two is that the base is in the sixth heaven, while its branches and trunk are in the seventh level. It is a tree, the low tree, from the base of which issues, comes out rivers whose water is never blackish, it does not change in taste or color or smell, and the sweat of, the, the sweat of those who drink it in paradise has the fragrance of musk. The rivers of milk, whose taste does not change after it's drunk. The rivers of wine, which brings only pleasure to those who drink it. And rivers of purified honey. Now, I don't like honey. If I drink too much milk, I get a stomach ache. Are we talking about the same milk and same honey? Or the same, oh, it's haram, I can't drink wine. No, no, no, no. Definitely not. This is something of Jannah, of that supernatural nature. When you once you drink from it, subhanallah. Hawd al-Kawthar, Rasulullah sallam says, that comes from Jannah into Mahshar, the, where we are going to be resurrected. He will be given to the Muslims. There are thousands of cups where people take and drink. The Mu'minin, the, the Ummah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is in the hadith of Rasulullah sallam, part of our aqidah. The people will be so parched with thirst on the Day of Judgment, they will be completely thirsty and dying for, th for water. They can't find anything except this particular one. 
Once you take a little sip, little cup from this particular Hawd al kawthar of Rasulullah in the pond, you shall never feel thirst again until you enter Jannah. Man, what kind of drink is this? If I drink something, no matter how sweet or how nice it is, I feel thirsty after half an hour, one hour, because it's hot, dehydrated. This is a different nature altogether. So you do not take these literally in the sense that it is like the milk that we get in the cartons, you know, pure milk or some honey from uh, some stuff that we cannot uh, eat very much. Some children do not, do not even touch honey. So don't take it that way. The lotus fruit that grows on this low tree resembles jars of hijar near Medina. It leaves, its, its leaves are shaped like the ears of a she-elephant. And each leaf could wrap up this ummah entirely. One version says, one of its leaves could wrap up all the creatures. What kind of? I have got no idea. Don't ask me. On top of each leaf, there was an angel who covered it with colors which cannot be described. Whenever he covered it by, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered it would change. One version says, it would turn into sapphire and some other color of beautiful nature. And it is impossible for one to praise according to what its merits. This is something of the outer world. And on it were moths of gold. What kind of a tree is this? Like an elephant, uh, the, what do you call? <laughs> Ears. It's so huge and can wrap everything. There are angels over, uh, everywhere. The leaves are changing color. And there are some moths, some, some insects, which are made out of gold. I've got no idea. Don't ask me. I've never been there. I've never seen it. But Rasulullah says, these are from the hadith of Rasulullah. Anything is possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can create anything. What do we know? My, rela my, my relative size to things is nothing. My relative understanding is the, uh, nothing. You see, there are certain scales in the world. They are so sensitive that only certain things which are also very light in weight can be measured on it. For example, if you go to a goldsmith, you want to buy some gold, he uses a particular scale which only, what does it do? Measure gold. Weight the, weight the measure. It's oh, three grams of gold. Three grams. Okay, maybe what do you call 10 grams or 20 grams of gold and they charge you accordingly. There are some scales where in warehouses, in the dockyards, they, they, if you go to the ships, they put a huge container on it. And it covers, it says, this is a couple of, uh, couple of thousands of, uh, what do you call? Tons. They can actually measure it. Yeah. Mine is smaller than that scale of the uh, goldsmith's uh, scale. When you put those huge things on my head, my head smashes. Doesn't understand. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. We don't see things. It doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, they, they say there is electricity here. You put your finger in it and you'll understand. As soon as you put your finger in it, until then, where's electricity? You can argue as much as you want. Doesn't make any difference. The truth is, there are laws, there are scenarios that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us that we cannot understand. One man came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's so excited. He says, Ya Rasulullah, he's a Badawi, he's from the village, he lives in the desert, he could hardly find any food to eat. And Muslims are going through so much difficulty of poverty at that time because they're surrounded by enemies. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about Jannah. What's in Jannah? So beautiful. One man comes, he hasn't got anything to ride on, he's got nothing, he's so poor. Probably hasn't eaten for two days. He says, Ya Rasulullah, in Jannah, yes, when I enter, yes, can I have an Arabian horse, Mustang? In his dream, a Ferrari is a Mustang, Arabian horse. Because he probably he's seen once or twice. Ya Rasulullah sallallahu says, yes, of course, but your horse will be made out of Yaqut, red sapphire. The man says, what? Sapphire. And it will have wings. And you get onto it and you ride, you fly on it. The man is thinking, how in the world is going to happen? Yep. Rasulullah sallam says, that's Jannah, the ultimate place of joy. So our understandings, we, if we were to judge rationally, without thinking, we will never be able to understand what this hadith is saying. So therefore, we need to let go. Take it as it is and say, Amanna wa We believe and we are absolutely 
trust in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa words. Sadaqa Rasulullah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke the truth. Sadaqa Allahu al-Azim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke the truth. Not a problem. Isra wa al-Miraj. If you were to deny, deny Isra, reject Isra, you become a kafir. Allah says, we have taken a, a, a servant, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from Masjid al-Haram ila al-Masjid al-Aqsa. Is Isra, night journey. You can say, Bro, brother, this doesn't make sense. How could this be possible? We live in the day of science and technology, and this is impossible to, you know, this is not science fiction. This is not a science fiction. And this is not a spiritual fiction also. This is a spiritual fact. Fiction is a made up story. This is not a made up story. This is happened. And we will see many of the things that Rasulullah told us in this hadith. Definitely we will see it without a single doubt. Now let's talk about this tree again. From the base of this tree comes out four more rivers. Two hidden rivers and two visible ones. Rasulullah speaks, explains. Rasulullah asked, What are these, Ya Rasulullah? No, what are these? When he saw these rivers, what are these, O Jibreel? Jibreel said, As for the hidden ones, there are two rivers of paradise. The visible ones are the Nile and Euphrates. What? These are two uh, big rivers in, in the Middle East. Ibn Kathir, the great Muhadid Mufassir said, what is meant by this, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, Allahu alam, is that these two rivers in uh, the Nile and the Euphrates resemble the rivers of paradise in their purity and sweetness and fluidity, fluidity and such their qualities as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith narrated by Abu Huraira. Al-Ajwa min al-Jannah, for example, the, the date called Ajwa is from paradise. That is, it resembles the fruit of paradise, not that it is itself originated from paradise. So it's a symbolic representation of certain things that happen here, because the only way that we can relate to certain experiences, if it resembles us. If it was a creature, an alien creature that we don't know, no, no idea, it's going to be scary to us. But if it's a horse shape, if it's a, you know, the, the wing shape, we can understand birds fly, the, the horses, uh, what do you call, run, and I, I'm settled on it, nice, beautiful. Yeah, I can relate to it, at least. So rivers, drink, wine, all these things are that human beings go through. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jannah in terms of rivers beneath which river, what do you call, rivers flow, the trees, the gardens. But and yet, we know 100%, Rasulullah sallam says, Jannah is a place that no imagination has ever encompassed. Nobody has ever seen what's in Jannah. It is the most fascinating place that nothing resembles, nothing, nothing on earth. Nothing to do. And our ulama explain this phenomenon. They say, how do you explain to the child who's in mother's womb, not six months old, seventh month old, still kicking a little bit, and to try to explain what internet is. You explain what birds and bees are. You explain what flowers are. Because the world of that little uh, human being, that embryo, is so dark. All he can hear sounds, nothing else. And his food is coming from there. He's never experienced any of those tastes. He's never experienced anything. Rasulullah says, Jannah is like that. You can never perceive, conceive. You can never understand how Jannah is. But we all want to go there, inshallah. For it, that were the meaning that the senses would testify to the contrary. Therefore, the meaning which imposes itself is other than that. Allah knows best. Similar to source of the origin of these rivers in the earth. Salsabil, the rivers. Kawthar, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa talks about honey and milk and the fragrant than musk about Kawthar and Salsabil. <coughs> At Sidratul Muntaha of the farthest limit, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw Jibreel Amin alayhi salatu wasalam in his true angelic form. He had 600 wings. Look, hadith says, every single wing could cover the entire firmament sky huge from his wings 
embellishments were strewn in all directions, such as rare pearls and sapphires of a kind, Allah alone knows best. Then Rasulullah was taken to the Kawthar and entered after Kawthar, entered into paradise. Lo and behold, it contains that no eyes has ever seen, no ear has heard, no human imagination ever, human mind ever imagined. On its gates of Jannah, Rasulullah saw written the following things. I wonder what's written on the gates of Jannah. It's in the hadith. Al Sadaqatu bi Ashrin Amthaliha Wal Qardu bi Thamaniati Ashara. Charity, Sadaqah is repaid ten times, tenfold by Allah. And the loan that you give it to a fellow Muslim as a loan, he is in need, is eighteenfold. Rasulullah said, O oh, Jibreel, how can the loan be more meritorious than charity? Jibreel Amin said, because one asking for charity may still have some need left. While the borrower does not borrow except his need is fulfilled. You need $5,000, here's $5,000. The sadaqah is just immediate for food, maybe. Rasulullah continued to travel until he reached rivers of milk whose taste does not change. The rivers of wine which bring only pleasure to those who drink it. And rivers of honey purified and overhanging those rivers were domes of hallowed pearl whose circumference is like the Aquarius star. Aquarius of the water barrier is a star constellation in the zodiac between Pisces and Capricornus. Huge, I have no idea. Another, another narration says this, above the rivers were pommels resembling the hides of the humped camels. Its birds were like the Bactrian camel. Upon hearing this, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu said, Ya Rasulullah, they are certainly delicate. Rasulullah replied, and daintier to eat yet. And certainly I hope that you, Ya Abu Bakr, shall eat from them. This is an indication that the rank of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu in paradise, as Rasulullah's hope, like his petition, is granted. Shaykh Muhammad ibn Alawi said, from all this it can be known that paradise and the fire exists already. That Siddhatul Muntaha of the Father's bounty is outside paradise. Then Rasulullah saw Kawthar and on its banks were domes of hollowed pearl. The soul of its banks were over fragrant musk. Then the fire was shown to him, Jahannam was shown to him. In it saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's anger, his punishment and sanction where rocks and iron to be thrown into it, into the fire, would consume them completely. If you were to, even the rocks or iron, whatever you put in, it just Jahannam consumes it. In it were people who were eating carrion. Yuck, disgusting. Rasulullah said, Who are these, Ya Jibreel? He replied, Those who ate the flesh of people. Ghiba. Then Rasulullah saw Malik. Who was Malik? The custodian or the gatekeeper of Jahannam fire. He was a grim figure whose face expressed anger. He is fixed. Rasulullah greeted him, gave him salam first. Then the gates of the fire were closed as he stood outside. And he was raised up beyond Siddhatul Muntaha of the father's limit. And a cloud concealed him from everything else. And Jibreel stayed back. Shaykh Muhammad ibn Ali said, Rasulullah's greeting of Malik before Malik greeted him first agrees with the subsequent wording of more than one narrator whereby Rasulullah said, I greeted him, Malik, and he returned my greeting and welcomed me. But he did not smile at me. Usually everybody else uh, gave me salams first, but this time I gave salam to Malik first. But he never smiled at me. And this is found in some of the other narrations of the hadith. However, the correct narration, as the compiler and others have, have said, is that it is Malik who greeted Rasulullah ﷺ first in order to dispel the harshness of his sight since his face showed severity and anger. It is possible to harmonize the two versions of this hadith. The fact that Rasulullah ﷺ saw Malik greet Rasulullah ﷺ first time, as we said, while Rasulullah ﷺ was first to greet Malik second time. In order to dispel this uh, is estrangement 
and the inspire familiarity. Now also that Rasulullah's side of Malik was not in the same form that those who are being punished see him. He saw the official face of Malik, not the people in Jahannam when they are burning. They see Malik. Malik so looks so angry and so vicious to those people that are five. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they beg Malik, oh Malik, please, please, beg Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to get us here. He says, huh? didn't the prophets come to you? Didn't anybody come to you to tell you? He says, enjoy, enjoy. But Malik showed his official face. Rasulullah was taken up to the point where he heard the screaming of pens. Not screaming, screeching of pens. As Sheikh Salim would put, the malaiki in the, the, the, the, the screeching. How does it work? In Turkish he says something. He says, screeching of the pens. The amazing feeling. I always remember. He always talks about this particular story. Since I was a child, I can remember. Writing the divine decree, the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He saw a man who had disappeared into the light of the throne, into the arush. He said, who is this? Is this an angel? It was said to him, no. He said, is it a prophet? Again, the answer was no. He said, who is it then? The answer was, this is a man whose tongue was moist with dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his entire life in the world. And his heart was attached to the masajid. And he never incurred the curse of his father or the mother. Subhanallah, what a way to go. Always, tongue is moist with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's dhikr. Rasulullah sallam says, you should make dhikr so much so that people, if they see you, they call you majnoon, mad. You should not die if you can afford to, he says, die in a state, except that your tongue is still, lips are still moist with dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, you're constantly in a state of dhikr. As Muhammad Zayed Qutku rahmatullahi alayhi used to say, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you finite nafas, breathing. Couple of billion, couple of million, you can calculate it scientifically. Not a problem according to your age. Then, he says, the, the truth of the matter is, out of these nafas that you have inhaled and exhaled, how many of them you remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how many of them you were in a state of ghafla? This is the point. This is the bottom line. He says, if you have remembered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such way, that if you have more remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than your ghafla, he says, you made it. And in Jannah, when people are completely entered into their places, every now and then they feel some sadness in their heart. And that sadness is, why did they, did they not remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than they did on earth. So a person, Rasulullah says, he will give this beautiful treatment. Not an angel, not a prophet, not somebody, but a Muslim, a simple Muslim. What was he doing? His, his uh, lips were always moist with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's in the world, and his heart was attached to the masajid constantly. Because in the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, there are how many people? Seven groups of people who are under the shade of the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is one of them. This is the description of that particular person. Given VIP treatment. He says his heart was attached to the masajid and he never incurred the wrath, the anger of his parents, mother or father. Meeting with Allah. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw his Lord, the glorious, the exalted, and he felt and made sajda. At the end of time, at that time, his Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spoke to him and said, Ya Muhammad, he replied, at your service, O Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ask. Ask. Wish, whatever you wish. This is actually after the actual happening. At that age, Jibreel Amin said, I can't move an inch. I'll burn into ashes. I can't move. This is your maqam, Ya Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You go. According to some of the ulama, Raf Raf, another creature came and took Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam beyond the beyond, farthest limit. And into the presence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala beyond dimensions. Beyond space, beyond time. Bila kayfiyya. Bila kayfiyya, without modality. You cannot give any 
time or space or shape or form, direction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is not Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? With adab, with his head down. He did what we, you, we do every day of our salat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to salute. At tahiyyatu lillahi wa salawatu wa tayyibat. All forms of salutations, bodily, spiritually, physically, with wealth, every form of ibadah is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala respond to him? The first meeting with his Lord. Assalamu alayka, ayyuhan nabi, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. O oh, salam be upon you, O oh, my nabi. My mercy and my rahmah be upon you. What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa respond back? Assalamu alayna. Your salam be upon us. Assalamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. And all those who worship you in sincerity, ya Rabbil Alameen, the salih, Muslims. And to this, all the malaika, Jibreel Amin alayhi salam, and all the inhabitants who are watching this, this amazing feast that they've never encountered before, all of them together. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. They make the shahada. I declare, we declare that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And we also declare that Muhammad Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his abd, then his rasul. His servant first. Highest maqam in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the maqam of the abd. Before he is the nabi, he is the abd. Therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers in the Quran, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken asra night journey, his abd, his servant, not his nabi. He's not Rasul. He says his abd. Ulama uh, tell us the maqam of abd is the highest maqam. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes through this process. Then he goes to sajda. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks, Ya Muhammad, ask. What do you want to ask? Go. It's your, this is your the, now time. Speak. Talk. What did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Ya Rabbil Alameen, you have taken to you, to, to yourself Ibrahim alayhi salam as your Khalil, friend. And you have given him an immense kingdom. MashaAllah. Such a dawla. You have spoken to Musa directly and have given Dawood an immense kingdom and softened iron and subjected the mountains to him. Dawood was, has a miracle. His miracle was, one of the miracles, that he will take an iron any shape he wants. Iron. Don't do it at home when you go home. Huh? You're not Dawood alayhi salam. He just turned into like, a, what do you call those, uh, Play-Doh. He can shape anything he wants out of iron. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him a king. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him a beautiful voice. That when you used to read, when you used to read Quran, the, the, not the, the Quran, uh, the Zabur, Sulaiman alayhi salam used to pull him, Baba, Ya Abi, enough, please, please, I beg you. Why? All the animals and all the people are dying. They all go into rapture and they just die because they cannot handle this beautiful voice. It's amazing ecstasy. That out of uh, the immense pleasure, he says, people are perishing, please stop it. Sure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this particular ability to do Dawood alayhi salam. Some of our mashayikh tell us, Imam Sha'rawi in his, uh, in his tabaqat, he mentions some people. He says, at certain time in the Islamic world, Muslim ummah, some of the people were completely prohibited to speak in public, in the masjid. When they get up on khutbah and they speak, they speak for 10 minutes, 5 minutes, not, not half an hour, one hour like me. And 5 minutes, 3 minutes, and 20, 30, 40 janazah also leaves the masjid. But his words are such, such an impact in the hearts of the people because they speak from the heart. They, people cannot take it, they just, what do you call? Die. I heard about uh, Ustaz uh, Abdurrahman Gursas, one of the Qurra, Allah Yerham, who passed away. He was one of the masters of Quran citation. When he used to read, when he was younger, that beautiful bulbul voice, people used to go into rapture, they go scream Allah, they let it out, and some people, in the, they don't allow to go to the second floor, because some people from the second floor, when they go Allah, they jump onto the, uh, what do you call, uh, they enter the masjid and die. So anything is possible. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who creates this effect in the hearts of people. Dawud alayhi salam had such power. Then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi says, Ya Rabbil Alameen, you have given Sulaiman alayhi salam, King Solomon, an immense kingdom and subjected the jinn and the men and the devils to him, as well as the winds. And you have given him a kingdom like no one may have after him. Then Ya Rabbil Alameen, you have taught Isa alayhi salam, the Torah and the Injil, and made him heal those born blind and the lepers, and raise up the dead with your permission. And you have protected him and his mother from cursed devil, so that the devil had no path by which to harm them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah is responding to Muhammad sallallahu wasallam. I have taken you to myself as my beloved. I have made you my Habibi. Habibullah, I have made you my beloved. Khalil different, Kalim different, the Ruh is different. Yeah, Safiullah is different. But I have called you Habib, you're my beloved. The narrator said, It is written in the Torah, Habibullah, Allah's beloved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continued. I have sent you for all people without exception. They all came to different parts of the world for different regions. But you are the universal prophet. A bearer of glad tidings and the one, a Bashiran wa Nadira. I have expanded your breast for you and relieved you of your burden. Alam Nashah Lak Sadrak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We have expanded your Sadr. Of your burdens we have removed. And exalted the name. Wa rafa'ana laka dhikrak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. I am not mentioned except you are mentioned with me, Ya Muhammad. What else do you want? La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. If somebody in the world says, I believe in La ilaha illallah, not Muhammad Rasulullah, does Allah accept that iman of that person? No, what is status? Qul in kuntum tuhibbun Allah, fattabi'uni. Jews and Yahud were walking around and says, well, Allah loves us, we love Allah, we believe in Allah, of course we know Allah. Then Allah revealed the ayah. Say to them, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if they don't believe in you and they don't follow you, there is no Muhammad Rasulullah, the equation is incomplete, therefore rejected completely. No deen is accepted from them except Islam. And I have made your ummah the best um ummah. Khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. Ever brought out for the benefit of mankind. I have made your ummah a mean and middle. I have made your ummah in truth the first and the last of all communities. First to enter Jannah. Last to come to this world. And I have made public address, Al Khutbah, impermissible for your Ummah, unless they first witness that you are my servant and messenger. When the Imam gets up in the Khutbah, when he starts to speak in public, anybody, what do they say first? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Then immediately after, was salatu was salamu ala Rasulina Muhammad wa ala Ali wa sahabi ajma'in. Otherwise, there is no barakah, there is no Khutbah. You cannot start a Khutbah just to talk. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, my auspicious. Get lost. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen first. Then, was salatu was salamu ala Rasulina Muhammad second. I have placed certain people in your ummah with injils for their heart. That is, repositories of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. And I, I have made you the first prophet created and the last one to, to be sent on earth and the first one heard in my court. And I have given you seven of the oft repeated verses, Surah Al-Fatiha, which I gave, you no, gave no other prophet before you. And I have given you the last verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, which Aman al rasulu that we read every night, which constitute a treasure from under my throne, which I gave no other prophet before you. Uh, ulama tell us, Aman al rasulu the last two verses of Surah Al-Baqarah, revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa without the agency of of Jibrail alayhi salam. And I have given you, Ya Muhammad, Kawthar, on the Day of Judgment. And I have given you eight arrows, that is shares in good fortune, Islam, immigration, hijrah, jihad, charity, sadaqah, fasting, Ramadan, ordering good, al-amr bin ma'roof, wa nahi anil munkar. And the day I created the heavens and the earth, I made fard upon you and upon your ummah, 50 prayers, therefore establish them, you and your community. 
then this 50th Salat came into now as a command. As you know the story, Allah, Rasulullah Sallam was so happy, he took everything and came back. And the Salat was reduced to five times a day, as we spoke about last week. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then says, My Ummah was shown to me, and there is none of the followers and the followed, but he is known to me. In other words, if he's my Ummah, I know them. Every one of you I saw. Identity. This is my Ummah, this is my Ummah, this is my Ummah, this is my Ummah. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, I will also remember you on the Day of Judgment, when I see you. As if I saw you, just met you. Some people, that when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam calls people on the Day of Judgment for Kawthar, the Hawd al the pond, on that when we are so parched with thirst, running towards Kawthar to drink, some people will be stopped. Some people, Malaika says, no, no, no, no, you're not allowed to come here. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my Ummah, my Ummah, let them come in. They said, Ya Rasulullah, this is not your Ummah. They look like your Ummah, but they are not your Ummah. Who are these then? These are the people of Bid'ah. After you, Ya Rasulullah, they changed the Sunnah. They changed the Deen. They invented things, innovations in the Deen. And they practiced those innovations as their Deen. Therefore, he says, these people are not part of your Ummah. The Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are the ones who adhere to the Sunnah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the letter. So he, was, he says, I have been shown all of you, one by one, met you. And I shall meet you on the Day of Judgment, the same. I saw that they would come to a people that were, wear hair-covered sandals. I saw that they would come to a people of large faces and small eyes, as if they had been pierced with a needle, subhanAllah. Nothing of that they would face in the future has been kept hidden from me, and I have been ordered to perform 50 prayers daily. All the Muslims from China, to Japan, to Africa, to Pygmies, anywhere in the world there is a Muslim, there is a masjid, and La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah is constantly made adhan and everybody 24 hours pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has been given three particular merits he is the master of the messengers Sayyidul Mursaleen he is the leader of the God wary Imam al muttaqin and the chief of those signs of light on their faces and limbs Qa'id al Ghurur al Muhajjaleen then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says in one particular narration Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us five daily prayers, the last verse of Surah Al-Baqarah. And third gift Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, whoever of this ummah does not associate anything with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does not commit shirk, is forgiven even the sins that destroy him. In other words, even if they did major sins, as long as they died with iman, they did not commit shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive that person. And his shafa'ah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, will be given to especially Put aside to those people on death row, on the Jahannam row. They're waiting, uh, they can't finish, khalas. They definitely go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give this intercession. Shafa'a to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, come, come, come, come, come, come, you, this lot. Yalla, into Jannah. Without going to Jahannam. Whoa, because we are Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, I've got about seven more pages to go. But I'm not going to go through. So your homework is, inshallah, Two, when you go into the website, you can download and read it from page 22 onwards. Okay, or you can go through the whole document. And right at the end of the document, I have also included the footnotes and the reference for those hadith in Sahih Bukhari. And the, many of the others, all in there inshallah ta'ala. You can go through and have a look inshallah ta'ala. Isra wa Mi'raj is not just a story. Isra wa Mi'raj is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the mu'mineen. When a Muslim does his salat properly, he is as if he's making a mi'raj of his own, personal mi'raj to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are in his presence. When you say Allahu Akbar, when you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, when you read the necessary, when you make the ruku and sujood, you resemble exactly what the malaika used to do in Bayt al Ma'mur. Some of them are always in, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, I've seen some of them always in ruku, some of them always in sujood, some of them always in 
Tahiyyat, making tashahud. There's so many of them constantly. So our movements within salat even resembles the, uh, the, uh, the prayer or the ibadah of the malaika. So alhamdulillah, it is the connection with the whole universe. Connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is us who make this connection if you have the khushu' in your heart. If not, if you pray like me, I'm thinking of what, is my, my, what my wife is going to cook for dinner. Is it going to be butter chicken or is it going to be pilau? Is it going to be something else? I'm so hungry, man. Uh, what did I read after Fatiha uh, in the second nakat? I've got no idea. I forgot. I mean, I only read after Fatiha in Natanya Qul Wallahu anyway. So even then I make a mistake. This is my salat. But there are some servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they're in salat, they are out of this world. Ali Karram Allahu Wajha, he was wounded. And many of the companions are saying, he was wounded on his leg. There was an arrow in his calf. They tried to take it out without any uh, anesthetic. It was impossible because it's so painful. He says, hold on. Let me do my salat, start my salat, and you take it off. Allahu Akbar. He's in a different world. They took it out. They stitched it. They bandaged it. After giving salam, he says, have you done it? He's done it. What kind of salat is this? When they, when they hear the adhan, their faces used to go pale. They say, why are you going so pale? Are you seen death or something? He says, what death? He says, don't you know who's calling for us? Don't you know what we're going to do? We're going to stand before who? The creator of the universe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's going to talk to us. We are his best of creation. We're going to do this. Salat is the mi'raj of a mu'min. Yep, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's mi'raj is important. And we must believe in it, according to Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. It's part of our aqidah. But nonetheless, what is our mi'raj? When Jibreel Amin, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually in the next few pages, talks about what happened when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came back. How did Abu Jahl treat him? All the hadith in this regard. How did the munafiqeen, how did the mushrikeen treat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Denied, rejected. When they came to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an, what did he say? He says, of course if he says it, it's the truth. He became a Siddiq. The status of an ideal Muslim. If you have any doubts about your deen, about the, uh, your, uh, your aqidah, about the ahkam of the deen, you have still lingering that you're not 100% certain to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is something wrong with you like me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inshallah instill that, instill that yaqeen and ikhlas into our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase our a'mal al-saliha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that qurbiya that he has given to those gift, as a gift to his beloved servants. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and minds and make us of the flag bearers of Islam in this country and in the world. True Muslims to the core. As Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِيمُ Say, I am a Muslim without a single doubt and I am straight as a ruler. No shifty business, half Muslim, half kafir. Half, uh, what do you call, the non-Muslim life, half Muslim life on Fridays. No, straight to the core. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that decency and boldness to practice our deen. Make proper tawbah in this month of Shaban, the month of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And inshallah Ramadan is about three weeks, three, three weeks away from us. And inshallah we enter into Ramadan prepared to reap all the benefits of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include our names amongst the salihin inshallah, siddiqeen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include our names amongst those muqarrabeen inshallah ta'ala. Allow us to enter into Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as first entrances inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us neighbors to our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Jannatul Firdaus al-A'la. Also may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that, grant us that greatest gift that is for us to experience his jamal, his beautiful vision from Jannah, inshallah ta'ala. Wa akhiru da'wana, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, wahtahu la sharika lak, nastaghfiruka, wa natubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal asr inna l-insana fi khusr, illa ladhina amanu wa amilu salihati, wa tawasaw bil-haqqi, wa tawasaw bil-sabr, sadaqallahu l-azim, lillahi ta'ala al-fatiha.